Hello, and welcome to part two of Ovarian Tumors, Clues to Classification for Beginning Trainees. Uh, today's uh, session, we'll uh, talk a little bit about uh, another uh, aspect of the uh, common epithelial tumors of the ovary. Uh, you recall our phylogeny with the common epithelial tumors, sex cord stromal tumors, germ cell tumors, metastatic tumors. Well, today we're going to talk about mucinous neoplasms in this first category, uh, although that will also bring us uh, to at least one uh, consideration of some of the metastatic tumors that can occur here. With mucinous epithelium, typically uh, we're most commonly dealing with the endocervical type of mucin uh, and uh, phenotype, uh, generally very basally oriented nuclei and uh, uh, clear pink cytoplasm, somewhat parallel uh, cell borders, uh, and an underlying uh, uh, fibromyxoid, occasionally uh, stroma, uh, that uh, often has the distinctive uh, ovarian type uh, characteristic. Um, as with the serous tumors, we again are dealing with a uh, subclassification scheme that includes benign tumors, which may be pure or mixed, um, clearly malignant tumors, uh, which are relatively uncommon, uh, and then a large group of borderline tumors uh, that may have uh, some or may not have some degree of atypia uh, up to and including intraepithelial carcinoma or uh, stromal invasion. Um, and with regard to the latter, uh, we'll talk about some of the uh, uh, boundaries uh, for that type of uh, process and perhaps the more difficult uh, area of pushing invasion. <clears throat> As I mentioned, most of these are of endocervical type, but we can also see in primary ovarian lesions a, an enteric or intestinal type uh, phenotype, which is CDX2 and CK20 positive, and different variations can be seen. <clears throat> Often these are uh, PAX8 negative, uh, and thus can be difficult to differentiate from true enteric uh, sources. Um, and the most important uh, metastatic site or primary site that makes things confusing is the appendix, especially the low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasms, uh, which we've talked about in another uh, video. Um, because of the variability, because of the massive size involved with these lesions, um, liberal sampling, sampling is uh, strongly recommended uh, so that we can uh, more, ri more reliably predict the behavior. Uh, a good rule of thumb is one section of tumor per centimeter of tumor. And now, of course, one can fit more than one section in a block, uh, so maybe three or four sections in a block of tumor. Uh, but for uh, some of these very large tumors, which may be 20, 30 centimeters at times, uh, that's still going to be a large number of blocks that you're going to need to examine uh, closely. So let's begin with uh, the benign end of the spectrum. Uh, here, as we can see, we have two sections, uh, one a very fibrous wall, one a more cellular fragment of tissue with some cystic spaces. Nothing much out here in the wall. Maybe occasionally you can have uh, remnants of endometriosis or other benign cystic lesions. Um, we see, as we look at the epithelium here, uh, what I've just described, nice basally oriented nuclei, parallel cytoplasmic uh, borders, uh, and a uh, pale uh, pink-purple type of mucin with underlying uh, loose fibrous stroma um, that is characteristic of the ovary. Um, as you can see, uh, we can get some degree of epithelial tufting and a little bit of variation, undulations uh, in this uh, epithelium. Uh, and still fall into the benign uh, cystadenoma category. Uh, most often, we're dealing with things that are very smooth and straight, but seeing some degree of un undulation or variability in surface is okay uh, within this category of uh, benign uh, cystadenoma, mucinous cystadenoma lesions. Uh, additionally, we can sometimes see areas where uh, there's uh, apparent rupture or incomplete epithelium, um, and you get an inflammatory exudate into the lumen of the uh, mucinous material, which can uh, sometimes uh, cloud uh, the appearance, uh, give you a variable uh, characteristic to the mucin. Of course, when you're draining these lesions, opening them, you'll oftentimes uh, detect that. You've got a uh, 
areas that are clear and watery, others that are more uh, mucoid and so forth. Here's another reaction that you can sometimes see, a little bit of stromal reaction. Uh, this is not invasion and it does not uh, need to move this case up to uh, a borderline category. Um, here we see again a little bit of tufting, a little bit of branching. That's okay in a benign mucinous cyst adenoma uh, if that's all you find. Uh, certainly this is a clue to look further to make sure that you don't have anything uh, more serious uh, than this uh, in, your, in your situation. Uh, and again, you can see the degree of complexity which is allowed. So let's go on to another case. Uh, this is a uh, case uh, which uh, um, has a, uh, again, this uh, large cystic spaces, variable variability here. Um, but we begin to see um, a little bit more complexity here. Uh, first of all, we see some more sieve-like glands down here. We see uh, secondary level branching, more stroma within uh, the papillae. Um, and here you can see some of this second order branching. So this would move it into at least a borderline uh, category. Um, again, our uh, nuclei in most of the areas are uh, fairly uh, uniform, basally oriented, uh, and uh, we don't see uh, too much crowding or atypia. We do begin to see uh, maybe a few uh, goblet type cells uh, here in this lesion. That's uh, not unexpected. Sometimes you can have mixed phenotypes and so forth. Um, this is a case uh, which uh, actually had uh, clear cut uh, carcinoma in other areas. Uh, but in this particular area, in this section, um, we have uh, only a borderline at most uh, type of changes. Um, and so again, this is to underscore the importance of thorough sampling um, of these lesions uh, and careful examination. Uh, here we see the interrelationships between the stroma uh, and these cystic spaces. And sometimes, you, again, you can get this uh, serpiginous scar-like lesion, such as we've seen in some of the mucinous cystic lesions of the uh, pancreas. Here you see more of this tufting and uh, uh, secondary architectural atypia that is uh, uh, consistent with um, at least borderline morphology. Now, another uh, factor that, as I've indicated, can be useful is to look at the contents. Uh, and when you start to see um, uh, tumor-like diathesis like this, necrotic cells, uh, inflammatory cells, admits the uh, um, uh, the uh, mucin, then you need to be uh, more and more concerned for the possibility of uh, malignancy. So that's a subtle sign. It's not an absolute, but it's a subtle sign that can help you to know when you need to be looking more thoroughly and more carefully. So going, oh, we've shown this, sorry. So what are the what are the thresholds that we're we're concerned about? Where where are the management uh, differences that are going to happen? Well, first of all, anything you call mucinous cyst adenoma is not going to get further follow up. So you want to be able to put solidly benign uh, on the lesion so that the patient uh, doesn't need to be further followed. Mucinous borderline tumors, on the other hand, uh, will have some degree of follow up. Um, and that will uh, increase uh, and may lead to further treatment uh, or at least staging uh, if there is either intraepithelial carcinoma within the uh, borderline tumor or evidence of uh, microinvasion. Um, mucinous uh, adenocarcinoma, uh, again, with uh, two different types of invasion, an infiltrative pattern, which would be with a more conventional type of uh, pattern that uh, we see in other tumors and other sites, and then this expansile pattern invasion uh, that is more subtle, uh, oftentimes more difficult to detect, and more uh, akin to what you see with, uh, say, verrucous carcinomas and those sorts of lesions, where it's that pushing uh, pattern of invasion rather than um, infiltration by single cells or small groups of cells. So let's look at uh, one of these cases. Uh, this is uh, an example of a uh, mucinous lesion. We can see the blue mucin here. Uh, as we look at this uh, lesion, can we move it from 
um, a uh, simple mucinous cyst adenoma into the borderline category or uh, that sort of thing. Well, we see here that there's uh, certainly a degree of complexity and elongation uh, of the uh, mucinous epithelium here. We see very long villus-like fronds with very narrow uh, fibrovascular cores. Uh, that's certainly uh, most likely going to move it into the, villa, into the uh, borderline category. Uh, we can look to see if we have any other second-order branching, um, and I don't think we do in this fragment. Uh, but we can go up here onto this fragment and see that uh, in this location here, uh, we have a considerable degree of atypia, more complexity of the glands, although still quite cytologically bland. Um, so this would, I think, justify the uh, diagnosis of a, at least the borderline neoplasm. Now, when we examine these lesions on frozen section, uh, we're not expected to uh, classify them as uh, uh, borderline, uh, benign, or um, um, malignant, uh, per se, uh, but classifying them as, uh, uh, to some degree, as mucinous, of course, um, and then allowing the surgeon uh, to exclude other possible uh, sources is important. And they understand that it takes extensive sampling to properly classify these lesions. So let's look a little further here. <clears throat> I don't think there's anything else in this lesion that would uh, push us any further. Um, this is a nice example of a mostly uh, benign mucinous uh, tumor uh, with a small area of borderline type of uh, epithelium uh, based on that uh, area of complexity that we've seen. Now, how much of that does it take uh, to make uh, the diagnosis a borderline? Uh, not really very much. I think uh, even if you see 1% or less um, that's of this sort of thing, uh, you should call it a borderline tumor, uh, although you may uh, want to uh, provide that uh, refinement in your report to allow the clinician to uh, judge uh, the severity um, and likelihood of recurrence or uh, relapse uh, in those patients. Here's another example. Um, <clears throat> again, we see at low magnification, uh, large cystic spaces filled with mucin, uh, but we can even see at this magnification that there's a fair bit of complexity to this uh, mucosa um, at low magnification. Um, here we can see the uh, mucinous uh, type epithelium, um, but we also begin to see that maybe these cells have a little more goblet-like character. So probably this is a more enteric type of uh, mucinous uh, lesion, uh, and we can begin to see more of this complexity and second-order branching of some of these uh, uh, cells, uh, almost a little bit more like a serrated uh, polyp. Uh, that you might see in the uh, left colon. Uh, again, we can appreciate that there's this little bit of condensation of stroma around all of the uh, uh, glandular spaces, um, cystic spaces that uh, goes nicely with the uh, diagnosis of uh, um, <clears throat> mucinous uh, borderline tumor. And uh, can be helpful also in defining uh, when you have uh, destructive or um, infiltrative uh, uh, invasion. Looking at this other fragment here, we will see here the uh, more uh, complexity and second order branching to some of these uh, tubular areas. Um, these are not invasive tumor. Uh, we can see that they're still subtended by this uh, stromal uh, type of tissue. And so this is just the, the tip of one of these that we've caught on an angle. Um, so a nice example, again, of a mucinous borderline tumor, this one with an enteric type phenotype. Um, and we'll want to examine all of these areas to make sure that, I'll say an area like this does not uh, indicate any uh, likelihood of uh, destructive stromal invasion. Um, and this sort of change could make you begin to worry about that. 
uh, but uh, in the absence of seeing clear-cut infiltrative pattern, uh, this type of reaction should not be uh, interpreted as the uh, early invasion uh, as we might in other tissues. So you'd like to th see things separated off uh, from this type of uh, a pattern before you call it invasive. <clears throat> So here's another mucinous neoplasm. Uh, and as we look at this lesion, we see again this nice, uh, sharply circumscribed uh, border. Uh, we see at low magnification a degree of complexity uh, with this uh, elongated uh, papillary structures um, and some <clears throat> areas of uh, hemorrhage surrounding it. We also can appreciate, again, this uh, ovarian type stroma. Uh, as we look at higher magnification, uh, we can see that these, many of these cells have fairly nice basally oriented cells. Uh, but as we look, we can see that there's a little bit of atypia in some of these other areas. So we're beginning to see some cytologic atypia. Uh, and here, as we see these uh, papillary structures tufting off into the lumen, uh, that's beginning to, uh, uh, and here a little higher grade cytology as well, uh, that begins to raise some concerns for either uh, <clears throat> mucinous uh, borderline tumor with intraepithelial carcinoma uh, or potentially something more serious. So we'll look at this one a little bit more carefully um, in these areas. Uh, again, I think we can see some of these little tufts have a little bit more atypia uh, like here uh, than other areas that we've uh, called borderline in the past. Now, as we come down here, uh, well, right off the bat, this gland clearly looks different than this one. Uh, and so uh, a good careful look at this uh, lesion uh, would say, gee, uh, you know, if I did, had this uh, everywhere, uh, this would be uh, carcinoma. Uh, and so uh, by virtue of finding an area like this, we can say we have at least intraepithelial carcinoma. And then, of course, we want to look further to see, do we have any evidence of invasion? So if this is a 20 centimeter lesion, you're going to be spending a good deal of time searching through those uh, uh, 20 blocks or 20 slides um, sections uh, to define areas that look worse. And again, here we see uh, enough architectural atypia to uh, call this uh, uh, intraepithelial carcinoma. As we look further um, down here, I think we can see here we have uh, nearly confluent growth uh, of this type of uh, lesion. So again, raising our concern that uh, this is a uh, potentially more aggressive and more concerning lesion, we're going to be looking for invasion. <clears throat> now this uh, case does illustrate one uh, feature uh, that I think is important. So in this fragment here, we see this generally smooth uh, boundary of uh, ovarian tissue to tumor. Um, and as we look at much of this, uh, we'll see uh, that it has some of that degree of atypia, which we saw elsewhere, um, and certainly some highly complex and uh, closely packed uh, glands. Um, as we look at this boundary, however, you know, we don't see that condensation of stroma that we saw elsewhere, and we are seeing this uh, intraepithelial type lesion uh, that is pushing into this uh, stroma. So maybe we can appreciate this at low magnification, that, that these are expanding and they're pushing uh, into this uh, uh, ovarian tissue here. So when we see this type of a, a pattern that is <clears throat> displacing other structures, compressing other structures, and pushing into the stroma, uh, along with this cytology, uh, this can be diagnosed as mucinous adenocarcinoma with <clears throat> pushing invasion. Now, uh, admittedly, this is growing out of a tissue where uh, we had essentially borderline appearance. Um, but here again, in an area like this, uh, we could see uh, that this type of pattern uh, 
uh, is likely going to be uh, pushing invasion or at least intraepithelial carcinoma. Um, this uh, diagnosis of pushing invasion is a challenging one um, and uh, one that should be made uh, with caution. Here's another lesion um, that has uh, clearly uh, uh, large pools of mucin and uh, accompanying uh, somewhat complex uh, mucinous epithelium. Uh, we see a little bit of tufting and branching over here, probably enough to make us uh, think more towards borderline. Uh, the other thing that we notice here is that this mucin has got a little bit of pink stuff in it. Uh, and that pink stuff is cells. Um, so this is not a clean mucin. Uh, and that again should raise our, our uh, level of scrutiny to make sure that we're not dealing with invasion. Here we see the condensed stroma around each of these in this uh, section. We didn't see uh, much in the way of cytologic atypia here. Let's look over at this other piece, however. Um, and I think here you can appreciate uh, even at low magnification, there's a distinction here. So if we look at this area here, these are nice rounded, um, confined areas. If we look at these, maybe even this one, these are expanding, these are pushing, these are extending uh, into this tissue. Um, and as we look at the cytology in this area, uh, again, we begin to see a higher grade cytology uh, with the uh, loss of uh, some of the mucin, uh, looks more, a uh, little bit more stratified. The nuclei are rounded up a little bit more, and you have a few uh, nucleoli. So uh, this, again, would be an area where finding this kind of a change, this kind of a sense of expansion uh, with a little bit of a dirty mucus would make us want to look all that much more closely to uh, define uh, pushing invasion or potentially destructive invasion. Now, as this happens with many of these uh, mucinous neoplasms, the fallopian tube is here pushed and adhered right up against this uh, uh, cystic uh, multiloculated mass of uh, ovarian and tube uh, together. <clears throat> so the final area I think that we want to cover, well, let's see, we'll, we'll talk about this one more case because this illustrates a couple of other points as well. Uh, so two pieces of tissue, two sections from a uh, 20 centimeter tumor. Um, and uh, we see that this section has, you know, cystic spaces. They're filled with reddish stuff, mucus, um, but it looks like a lot of the tissue is dead. Uh, we don't have much in the way of epithelial lining, a little bit of residual here. Um, and we have a number of cases where the, the epithelium is all gone or it's... Uh, that, and then we've got areas where mucin is spilled out into the stroma. So do uh, these stromal mucin pools define this case as uh, an invasive carcinoma? And the answer is no, uh, but they do make you a much more uh, uh, hyper alert to uh, identify uh, that uh, possibility. So seeing extracellular mucin without uh, epithelial cells does not make this mucinous carcinoma, but should make us uh, very cognizant to search uh, for this uh, type of lesion. Likewise, seeing uh, necrosis uh, in one of these lesions should also be a signal that uh, the tumor is expanding too fast and that may be due to tumoral growth. So here's a area of viable tumor. Uh, looking at this, we can see uh, again, mucinous epithelium, a degree of complexity of architecture that is at least borderline. Uh, but we're not seeing too much in the way of atypia, at least not right here. Uh, we've got some goblet cells, so probably a, a, an enteric or mixed phenotype. Uh, we do see a few areas here, uh, particularly in these uh, more crypt-like areas, where the nuclei become a little bit more stratified uh, and um, more adenoma-like. Um, perhaps suggesting that there's at least some dysplasia of some sort going on in this enteric uh, type neoplasm. Looking at the rest of this uh, lesion though, we see uh, that we don't have any areas uh, that uh, would be identifiable as 
uh, either invasive carcinoma uh, or in even intraepithelial carcinoma, although we did have those areas that I pointed out to you where we have some degree of cytologic atypia. So uh, those two caveats, uh, seeing necrosis makes you want to search harder. Seeing extracellular mucin uh, should be, again, not a marker of malignancy, but a marker of concern to thoroughly sample and study the lesion to exclude um, invasive neoplasia. So the last area of concern is uh, when we do have uh, um, uh, mucinous neoplasm, and we do see these uh, clearly with uh, viable uh, tumor cells. Let's see, I don't know if we do have them here or not. Uh, but clearly, we've got extracellular mucin here. Um, and I believe as we go around here, uh, we can find here some area where we've got uh, mucinous epithelium here. So uh, seeing this type of a lesion, it's from the ovary. Uh, we might say uh, mucinous neoplasm with extracellular mucin. Um, cannot exclude uh, mucinous carcinoma and so forth. Fairly low-grade cytology, as we can see here, uh, nice columnar cells. So this was our ovarian tissue, and uh, lo and behold, uh, telling the surgeon that, they go and look and say, oh, look, here's the appendix. And on exam, the appendix has low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm. So this highlights the fact that uh, appendiceal neoplasms from the gastrointestinal tract uh, can have low-grade mucinous neoplasms that can extend to and involve uh, the peritoneum and the ov ovarian parenchyma. Uh, here we see epithelium outside uh, in one of these pools of mucin uh, with sort of a pseudomyxoma peritonei type of appearance uh, that arise from low-grade uh, appendiceal neoplasms. Um, so that's uh, the caveat. Um, here actually is another uh, such case, uh, this a uh, little bit more um, uh, challenging in the sense that as we look at this epithelium, uh, we see some associated ovarian-like stroma, um, as well as these pools of mucin. Um, this was again a case uh, which had low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm uh, that had involved uh, the ovary. And here we'll see uh, there's no high-grade epithelium here. It's all this low-grade uh, type of uh, mucinous epithelium. So don't be uh, uh, dis disturbed by the fact that you don't see uh, high-grade atypia or even uh, def definite uh, dysplasia in one of these neoplasms. They can still be metastatic uh, from an enteric source, such as the appendix, gallbladder, and so forth. Um, and that warrants uh, further um, study on the part of the surgeon uh, to potentially remove or identify those lesions. Um, brings me back. Let me just go back quickly here uh, to one, uh, this case here. So this was a, such a case uh, that presented that sort of challenging interpretation because in this case, uh, the patient had a unilateral ovarian mass, but uh, on identifying this as a mucinous neoplasm, um, the, the surgeon reported back, well, the appendix is missing and the other ovary has been previously removed, um, which uh, raised uh, uh, certainly a level of concern that this actually was a uh, mucinous uh, lesion arising from the appendix uh, that had maybe previously involved the other ovary and which had been resected, uh, but this one had been left behind. So this was actually signed out as mucinous, uh, low-grade mucinous neoplasm uh, because of that uncertainty um, in the diagnosis. Okay, so I got all our ducks together, uh, and we've talked about all of these uh, mucinous neoplasms. Notice that I haven't talked about the high-grade mucinous carcinomas. Those are easy. Uh, it's these low-grade and borderline lesions that uh, present all of the consternation and frustration for us, um, uh, by and large. And so. Uh, I've tried to focus the attention here. I hope you'll come back and take a look at these slides, study them yourselves, um, and develop a good feel for uh, how to classify and uh, cope with these. Um, so uh, that's uh, the end of part two.
hopefully bringing this uh, topic back in, uh, into a greater degree of focus. And we'll look forward to uh, talking to you again when we do uh, part three. Uh, so until next time, thanks for joining us.